Nestled in the north central part of Nigeria, Nasarawa State was carved out of the old plateau state by the Sani Abacha administration, which announced the creation of new states on 1st October 1996. This makes Nasarawa State one of the youngest states in Nigeria. Now steering the ship of the state in its 20th year is Governor Umaru Tanko Almakura, who was elected into office as the fifth governor of Nasarawa State in 2011. Governor Almakura joins us on view from the top today, and I want to thank him very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. And I thank you for joining us. My name is Modele Sharafa Isof. It promises to be a long conversation, so let's get right down to it immediately after this brief biography. Governor Umaru Tanko Almakura was born around 1952 in Lafia, Nasarawa State. He attended Kefi Teachers College and then Government Teachers College of Education, UU. For a short period in 1975, he was an assistant producer at the Broadcasting Corporation of Northern Nigeria. He then went to Ahmadu Bello University, from where he graduated with a Bachelor of Education degree in 1978. For his National Youth Service, he was a teacher at the Government College Makodi, and upon completion of the service, he formed Almakura Nigeria Limited and later Ta'al Nigeria Limited, which deal in agricultural and industrial machinery, real estate and hospitality. Alaji Almakura was elected governor of Nasarawa State in 2011 and he was re-elected for his second term in 2015 on the platform of the APC. Your Excellency, when you first took over the reins of government, you complained about the decay in infrastructure and lack of technological advances in Nasarawa State. Give us a self-assessment in these areas five years into your administration. You see, Nassau State, when I took over in 2011, had no single kilometer of asphalt road built by the state government. All the asphalt roads you see within the state were federal owned. So there was no way the people of Nassau State could move around easily from one local government to another to enhance social, political, economic endeavors. So I considered building of roads and ensuring there is effective communication physically between one community and another uh, was very, very necessary. To also consider those people in the hinterland, in the rural areas, whose only desire for government is to provide easy access to the next village, maybe during market days or during celebrations and things like that. These were all lacking. So physical infrastructure was, to me, the most fundamental thing that the people of Nassau State needed. Then, of course, social infrastructure. The schools were in dilapidated forms. A lot of them were, were completely decayed, and this was not only affecting school enrollment, it was also affecting standard of education. So basically I can say one of the motivation that urged me to contest for the office of governor is to ensure physical um, transformation and social uh, uh, transformation of the people of Nasrao State so that at least we'll be able to have what it takes uh, to benefit from uh, what a state is supposed to have in modern day Nigeria. Your state gets one of the lowest allocations from the Federation account. I know many governors are waiting for the review of the revenue allocation formula. How soon do you think it will happen? And how do you think it will affect your state? I think I will be the, one of the happiest governors if the revenue allocation is, is, is re reviewed uh, positively. As it is now, Nasrallah State happens to be one of the lowest in terms of revenue accruals. I can say without any contradiction that we are either the number 35th or 36th. We never went above that level in terms of the quantum of revenue allocation to the state since I came into government. We have been uh, competing with equity in the lowest rung among the states. So uh, anything to do with uh, revenue allocation review upwards uh, will be a thing that uh, my state will really uh, appreciate and it will, it will have a lot of 
positive effect in bringing uh, government closer to the people. I must say that uh, averagely since I came, the state was getting about just two billion every month. And if you put that side by side with the demands, especially the salaries and wages and what have you, you find that uh, a governor is just merely being a paymaster. You just talked about payments to civil servants. Someone once described the civil service as Nigeria's inadvertent social security program where people get paid for doing little or nothing. It might be an exaggeration, but you know, the civil service is not known to be the most effective workforce. Yet a huge chunk of government resources goes to the civil servants and other public servants under the fanciful title of cost of governance and recurrent expenditure. Nasarawa State has a workforce of about 25,000, which constitute less than 1% of the entire population of the state. Yet, 56% of the 2016 budget is earmarked for recurrent expenditure. How can government at all levels tame this recurrent expenditure monster? You see, we have inherited uh, an XX baggage from the administrations that have been there before. What do I mean by excess baggage? This is uh, a workforce that is so bloated, so, so amorphous, that you need only a fraction of it to work efficiently. But there you are. The system does not allow you to take any unilateral decision because most of their engagement are statutory. So one has to be really, really careful about what um, approaches one does with regard to recurrent expenditure because some of those things are there and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Take for instance, we have a population of about, projected population of about 333 uh, million people. And the total number of workers, including political appointees in the state are not more than 30,000. 30, so that is, that is 0.1 percent. But as it is, the recurrent expenditure are things that have become statutory, they have become mandatory, they have become constitutional. There's nothing you can do about it. You cannot just wake up one day and say you cannot pay salaries or allowances or certain emoluments that you have inherited simply because they make the uh, recurrent expenditure uh, unbearable. You cannot do that. So I think the only way out is why we keep faith with uh, our commitments to our employees, workers, uh, by doing what uh, we are supposed to do. Uh, we also have to uh, think deeply on issues that have to do with accountability, prudence uh, in governance. Because if you don't do that, by the time you have paid all the and current expenditures, you wouldn't have anything left. So the little that you are left with, if at all, if you don't prudently use it, if you don't uh, become accountable in every naira you spend, then you are putting the state into jeopardy. Uh, to be fair, you have tried to take the bull by the horn by cutting salaries across board. I is that a pill that you would prescribe for other states suffering the same ailment? Oh, thank you very much. I think this is a question I would want a little more clarification, to, to give more clarification, because it has been uh, greatly misunderstood. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did not reduce worker salaries in my state. And don't forget, Nassau State happens to be uh, one of the first states to implement the minimum wage. And as God would have it, when we implemented this minimum wage. Uh, we were with the euphoria that we were doing what was right to our workers. And in the course of that, the implementation became a little more exuberant in the sense that the minimum wage law says there should be no worker who should earn less than 18,000 per month. That's, that's, that's the law. Now, in our quest to ensure compliance to this uh, national uh, law, uh, the implementation 
increase the salaries across the board. But from January this year, the thing became unbearable. Then I called the workers. I said, okay, uh, we implemented the minimum wage by giving salaries three times across the board. Why don't, you, uh, why don't we adjust it? If we adjust it by just removing about 30%, most of my workers in the South State will receive much more than 20 states in the Federation. So in, NS, in, in essence, it is not reducing their salary, it is adjusting it. The adjustment would even make them in a position to receive much more than most states in the Federation. And to, 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 be, to, be, to, be, to emphasize, we never tempered with the minimum wage. In any case, we are in the process of negotiation to see whether they could accept or not accept. But we have gone back to status quo, uh, pending when the negotiation would, would be through. But meanwhile, whatever we are able to get from the federation account is what we give to the, uh, the workers. Are there states that are not viable? And what should we be doing about them? The issue of viability in terms of state is, is, is relative. I think uh, it all has to do with priorities of a particular state. I don't believe there is a state that is not viable. For my state, my critical uh, needs have to do with infrastructure and social transformation. And if I could uh, put the states in row, and so the local governments in row, one after the other, to be doing this. Uh, I, I believe we'll be able to sustain uh, the tempo of development, and uh, we won't we won't we won't have any 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 pro, uh, any problem. So I think is the priority. What does the state need? What are your earnings? How can you meet those things? If you cannot meet, meet them at a go, then you can stagger them uh, one after the other, and I'm sure it will work. You talked about the local governments now. You once called for a complete restructuring of the local government system. What have you found to be wrong with that tier of government? And what can we do to remedy the, the situation? The greatest problem we have in local government that we need certain restructuring has to do with properly articulating what are their functions, what are the roles each department is supposed to uh, to do, but where you go and find that in the in the in the Department of Health, you have about two thousand people when you really need only one hundred people. I'm just giving you an example. So it may be social 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 welfare department. You find that maybe you need only one hundred and fifty people, and you take about seven hundred, or agric, where you may probably need two hundred people. And within the local government, they will take up to 500. So unless they sit down and uh, reorganize the operations of each department to ensure that the number of people that are required to man those uh, functions are the number of people that are employed, uh, the local government will continuously have the problem of lack of funds to sustain itself. Because unlike states, local government are seen as an extension of social welfare or social security outfit where anybody who comes as the chairman of the local government must employ as many people from either his village or from his constituency so that by the time he leaves, he leaves the excess baggage for the next chairman to, 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 carry, to, 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 to carry along.